Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a super interesting guest, David Pogue. Uh, He was a New York Times weekly tech columnist from 2000 to 2013. He's a five-time Emmy winner for his stories on CBS News Sunday Morning. Uh, He's been a New York Times bestselling author, a five-time TED speaker, and a host of 20 Nova Science specials on PBS. That's awesome. We're going to talk about uh, climate change. And uh, Dave's accolades continue on for quite a long time. But, uh, again, very accomplished person. So, Dave, thank you for coming. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your experience with New York Times and writing and uh, you know, all the, the science topics you were involved in. What was that like for you? Yeah, the um, I, I started out as a musician, believe it or not, and I spent ten years working on Broadway shows as a like a pit musician and a conductor, and oh, cool. uh, I started getting into technology only because of sheet music software that um, that was kind of a specialized niche, and I became sort of expert on this uh, on Finale, this like sheet music software. And so next thing I knew, I was writing about it and writing reviews of music software, and that led to computer magazines. And then that led to the New York Times. So I wrote this technology column for a long time. And uh, I think that's where I probably honed my chops on being an explainer, which I think is the one through line of everything that I've done is sort of explaining difficult mm-hmm. topics in tech and science. And uh, so that led to the Nova gig and that led to CBS Sunday morning. And here I am. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed, you know, thousands of different scientists myself and some are very articulate and you can understand easily and some really get into the weeds. But um, yeah. in general, the public, it is very helpful to have stuff explained in plain language. So that's a really cool job that you did. I don't know. Any memories of some of the technologies that you've encountered and reviewed that, you know, ones that you thought had great promise that were disappointing or ones that you thought wouldn't be a big deal that are now hugely influential? Like, What are some of the surprises for you over time? You know, I think the the through line of the things that I thought would be winners, and I was generally right, are, are things that simulate magic. I mean, this might sound weird, but, you know, being able to open your phone and change your thermostat a thousand miles away or to turn speech into text or text into speech or, you know, age yourself in a photo. I mean, all that stuff is just magic to me. And I, and it's sort of predictable when those things will will catch on. So, you know, the minute I saw the smartphone... Uh, you know, the first iPhone, I kind of knew that would be a big one. And then in a similar way, you can sort of, you can sort of see which ones are going to be the turkeys. I still remember this thing. It was a $300 box. This is way before YouTube and things, probably 2000 or something where you paid a subscription fee and you could watch any TV show on demand 
which is, of course, now we take that for granted. But at the time, it was like, what? We don't have to sit in front of the TV at a certain time. And it, it turned out you could only do that with TV shows that they had worked out a deal with. And it was like Turkish mm. sitcoms and, mm. you know, British cooking shows. It was just like there's nothing to watch on this thing. So you could see the future, but it wasn't that. Very interesting. What, what have you noticed that friends and family or work associates, like what, their perceptions of technology and science versus yours, is it very different? You know, even though you've been exposed to so much of it, like what's it like when you interact with other people and talk these issues? I think so. I think one thing I've noticed is that there's so much new technology and new science that the masses, the public has this sort of the, the backlash that we're seeing against you know, against the COVID vaccine or against climate change or against 5G. I think it's just people's way of saying, whoa, there's too much new, too much new stuff coming too fast. I can't, I can't handle it. I'm feeling insecure. I think it's a a deep seated sort of psychological reaction, a self-protective reaction that's in some ways understandable. I, I, I noticed, by the way, that there's no backlash to science we grew up with, right? Nobody argues that there's, you know, photosynthesis. <laughs> you know, no one argues that babies come from women. You know, no, there are certain things that we, no one, no one argues that water. Well, some people are starting to argue that, unfortunately, but yeah, <laughs> babies coming from women stuff. Well, I mean, I mean, nobody thinks that humans lay eggs is what I'm saying. So like, for the most part, established science that we grew up with not rebelled against, but it's the new science, and especially invisible science. Like, uh, you know, 5G is invisible and, you know, software is invisible and viruses are invisible. So those are the things I think tends to lead to pushback. In your conversations with other people, though, do you, are they surprisingly well-informed or are they not informed? Like, what have you noticed that, uh, you know, the common person thinks about and, you know, in terms of science and technology, like where is their head at versus yours? I guess it depends on the circles, you know, like, like who you're talking to. If you're talking to you know, East Coast college educated readers of the New York Times. Yeah, they're, they're going to be pretty well read. I don't necessarily consider them the majority though of, of Americans. Mm. So I think there's a a wide spectrum and you know, I have, I have my own podcast now. It's called unsung science. And the idea is each week to, to reveal the origin story of some super cool science or technology breakthrough, like, you know, how the COVID vaccine came about or how we landed a a, a rover on Mars by remote control and things like that. And the whole idea here is to try to overcome some of that resistance to new new science by making it familiar, you know, because I feel like it's the unfamiliar that scares us. So let's make it familiar. Let's meet the people who did the work and find out, you know, what was the hard part and how did they work through it? So I think that's that's part of my mission there, too. Yeah, that's really cool. What what are some of the technologies that just are really memorable for you? You thought they were amazing, whether they came to light or not. You know, Microsoft had a watch like 20 years ago. It's called the Spot Watch. That was sort of a precursor to the Apple Watch. And it was it was really cool from a technological standpoint. I mean, it did a lot of good stuff. Get your texts, could get your emails, you know, weather, stocks, news, all that kind of stuff. It uh, here again, it was not the technology, but the licensing that ran them aground. They had to work out this goofy system with the cellular companies where it wouldn't work if you left your area code. And it was also $10 a month, um, which I guess is what we pay now for, for a cellular watch subscription. But at the time people were like, what? You're going to pay a cell subscription for your watch, but I could see it. I could see it happening. So what are you working on uh, lately? What's fascinating you right now? Well, I'm helping to spread, trying to spread the word about my new book, which is called How to Prepare for Climate Change. And the idea here is we hear mostly about trying to stop climate change, which is very important. We need to cut our emissions and electrify our transportation and eat red, less meat and so on. But there is another approach to climate change that hardly anyone talks about, and that's adapting to what's happening now. So this book is about where to live and what to grow and how to talk to your children, how to insure, how to invest, um, and then how to prepare for individual disasters like fires, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, drought, and and so on. So I really feel like it's a a a one-of-a-kind sort of handbook to 
preparing yourself because because companies and governments are doing this. They're they're building seawalls and they're developing drought proof seeds. But I feel like the individual is not really being given a way to do that. So that was the idea behind mm. how to prepare for climate change. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Well, what are, yeah, what are some of the recommendations in the book that maybe are interesting to people or useful? Um, yeah, I think, I think mostly the, the question most people want to know is, oh, where should I live if I have the opportunity to move? 40 million Americans a year do move, whether it's a new job or change in relationship status or getting out of school or the military. And so if you have that opportunity and you have a choice of places, the, the problem is the entire Western half of the United States is having really severe water shortage problems. And that's, that's going to get a lot worse. You know, on the East coast and the Southern coast, you've got the hurricanes in the lower part, the lower states, it's ridiculous heat waves and flooding. So really the sweet spot is the Great Lakes area, the sort of top middle part of the country. And what's convenient about that is a lot of these cities, these grand old cities, Cleveland, Buffalo, Madison, Syracuse, they have a lot of, first of all, very low cost of living. Um, they don't get hurricanes or fires. Um, they don't have, uh, water shortages because they've got, they've got the great lakes right there. And these cities are ready for, you know, for, to grow. They, they were built for an older time when they were industrial cities. So there's a lot of space and a lot of capacity for, for incoming people. And a lot of great people live there, like nice people, educated people. So. That's that's sort of the answer to that question. If you think about those Great Lakes states and you have an opportunity, there's some some great living there, and they're not going to be heat waved like the rest of the country. So you think that these places might actually come back into favor if uh, the West and the you know the Southwest turn so inhospitable that people you know want to they, they're going to migrate out of there? You think at some point? I I can actually guarantee it. I I I'm not an expert on any of the topics in this book. That was all based on interviews with people who are experts, and 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 that's what everybody said is like. There's no question the Great Lakes is going to have this renaissance. I I can't tell you what the timeline is for that. I think it's taking people a long time to come to terms with climate change, and you know the latest figures don't show any slowdown in people moving to Florida in Arizona, which is frankly crazy i mean those are the those are the states that are going to hit they're already getting hit worse than first by the effects of climate change so it might be 30 years before we start to see these big numbers changing but i think it's inevitable that all over the world people are going to move north out of the hot zones and into the more comfortable regions well a lot of people leave the you know the northeast or the north the snowbirds etc or if there's not economic opportunity um, if climate change does occur, and again, the, the South and the West and Southeast become more inhospitable, what's going to be necessary besides maybe a tiny bit warmer weather in the North to make people leave? Is it just that the South is going to be so inhospitable that there's no choice? Or do you think that, that governments, people, economies, et cetera, will recognize this trend and then start building more in the North? What, well, one thing that's already happening, the, the fires and the droughts in the western states, California, you know, Oregon, Washington, that's already having a huge relocation effect. We're seeing thousands and thousands of people moving out of California just because the fires are just terrifying. I mean, in 2019, there was that day in San Francisco when the sky was black at, at 12 noon from the smoke. The air was orange. It was really sci-fi apocalyptic. So wow. that's happening. And then, you know, in Arizona and, and some of the Texas, some of those states are going to be facing the drought crunch increasingly. 
where, you know, the first thing that will happen is there will be restrictions, and there already are. You know, how many gallons of water are you allowed to use a day? You're not allowed to wash your car, not allowed to water your lawn. And eventually, it's just going to become miserable to live there. I, I don't know if you read that headline from 2019 where there were days in Arizona at the Phoenix airport where airplanes couldn't take off because it was so hot. The air was too thin to provide lift over the wings. I mean, yeah, my friend about... was in uh, Arizona 20 some years ago and he told me about that day, which was crazy. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a changing world and I don't care what the tax incentives are in some of these states sooner or later, it's going to not be fun to live there. What other um, big changes do you see that climate change will bring, uh, you know, across nations? Will certain nations, um, I mean, essentially just be doomed and the whole nation will fall apart or like what kind of dynamic countrywide do you think this will be? I think in the long term, it's, it's pretty clear that when you say doomed, I mean, well, like Bangladesh, supposedly yeah. Bangladesh, a lot of it's below sea water, sea levels. If, yeah, exactly. If the ocean right. rises, Bangladesh may be completely subsumed, maybe. Yeah, we will. There will be areas that we have to abandon. Yeah, this is absolutely true. Bangladesh, a lot of low lying, poorer countries, and also a lot of areas will become ungrowable. A lot of places where we now have, you know, cropland is going to be non cropland. The cropland is shifting north. Chinese investors, by the way, are buying up millions of acres of land in places like Greenland. They're anticipating an area where these now frozen areas, formerly frozen areas, become useful agricultural cropland. I think I think that's probably inevitable that, that things are shifting north. That's happening in this country, too. I was talking to, for the investment chapter, I was talking to an investment guy at Morgan Stanley, and he said, I would invest in farm equipment. And like, why? And he said, because the farming zone where you can grow, the temperate zones where you can grow crops in this country is shifting north. It's not going to be Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa. It's shifting north as the climate changes. And that means new farmers in new places. And they're going to need gear. So there's some really unexpected effects, too. How many experts have you spoken to about various aspects of climate change? And, you know, what are some of the other big themes that you've seen? For this book, it was about uh, about 60 experts, and really the one that blew my mind the most, <laughs> it's going to sound super boring to you and your listeners, but was the insurance chapter, because, I mean, we just sort of take for granted insurance, but uh, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that homeowner's insurance and renter's insurance does not cover flooding. A lot of people don't even realize that, and flooding is coming on strong. And I'm not just talking about on the coasts. Last year, seven of the 10 most flooded states in terms of federal disaster areas were inland states, not on the coasts. And that's because in the climate change era, you get you get a dry spell, you get drought, so the ground gets hard and dry. And then you get these torrential rains and the rain has nowhere to soak in So it just runs off the hard ground into our homes and our businesses. So flooding is a giant thing. And the insurance companies have all, for the most part, gotten out of flood insurance. It's just, it doesn't pay. Like you can't make money on flood insurance because people are filing so many claims. So the government in the 70s stepped in and said, tell you what, we'll provide flood insurance for those who want it and need it. And that, that program called the National Flood Insurance Program, that is now hopelessly in debt. That's $25 billion in debt because everybody who's got that insurance has been filing claims from all the hurricanes and all the rainstorms. And Congress is really tied in knots about what to do with it. You know, like they could raise their rates, but then these Congress people would not be reelected. <laughs> they won't, they won't vote for, for raising the rates. So the program just gets more and more in debt. And some of the insurance experts I talked to said insurance is going to go away, you know, for things like fire and flood, like no company can afford to issue it. And so it'll become either really expensive, something available only to rich people, or people will have to self-insure, which is also available only to rich people. So it it's a, it's a huge looming problem that not a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, that's really interesting. Did you interview any people that, um, you know, are not, 
uh, bought into climate change. They think that everything's fine or they think that things are not as bad as they say, et cetera. Pretty close. There, There is a chapter on how to speak to deniers. And I, I spoke to five psychologists and therapists and I, I learned a, re- a lot. I mean, for example, it turns out there have been actual research studies on this point. If you try to explain to a climate denier why they're wrong using statistics and figures and facts, you will be, you'll find it counterintuitive. They will retrench. It's a, it's a scientific fact that, well, somebody put it to me like this. You can't change somebody's mind with facts and figures of an opinion that wasn't formed by facts and figures in the first place. And that's, that's the truth. So if you want to speak to a denier, you have to do it in emotional terms. You know, my, my kid can't sleep at night. He's so, you know, anxious about the changing climate or my uncle in Nebraska had his entire farm flooded last year. I'm really panicking. Things like that. That stuff works. That can start the conversation. I should also note though, Richard, that the number of what we call climate deniers is much smaller than you think. I, I think, I think people who say the climate isn't changing at all. I think there are hardly any people like that left. I think the only debate is what's causing the change. Is it man-made or not? Yeah, that's what I mean. Have you spoken to any, I'm not talking about regular folks, but scientists that are specialists in, um, you know, in climate, that kind of thing, and spoke to them about their opinion, and their opinion may not have been exactly what, uh, you know, the opinion of most of the people you spoke to. Have you found any scientists, again, that have uh, differing opinions? I have to say no. I, I think you'd have a hard time finding anyone who's looked into the the data and and concluded that the climate is fine. I spoke to Richard Muller. He's a big Berkeley geophysicist, very prominent, big published author who used to be a climate denier. And then a couple of years back, he decided to study the the numbers himself. And he became (laughs) a really frightened climate change uh, advocate. And he published a big editorial in the New York Times that said I was wrong. So so he used to be a, a denier. But yeah, in the scientific community, I think it's it's pretty solid consensus. Also the angle your book takes is is a bit different. You know, like like you said, uh, it just seems like everyone's saying, you know, we're in trouble, we're in trouble, we have to do this, we have to do that. But I guess yours is more of a practical take. Okay. At least some degree of it's happening and it's gonna to continue to happen, maybe a large degree. So how do you prepare for what's happening no matter what you can do? Yeah, like I, that's what it's about. I, that is precisely what it's about. I literally could not have described it any better. My, my editor calls it the first uplifting book about climate change, which is hilarious. But it, it is true is that, you know, a cure for depression is taking action. Like depression is not just, oh, my situation sucks. It's my situation sucks and I'm helpless to change it. So the fact that this entire book is actions you can take right now to make yourself more resilient, your family, your home, your finances, that does make it a reassuring book. At least my editor thinks so. And there's a lot of steps that, you know, you can, you can do for free this weekend and it'll, it'll make you feel better. You know, my, uh, in, in many, many states, a go bag is considered a necessity. This little backpack you keep in the front closet with a couple days worth of stuff that you could survive on if you had to run out of the house right away. You know, snacks, first aid kit, flashlight, documents that, that show who you are and that you own this home and so on. And in, in California and the hurricane states, I mean, man, they use these, these things. You know, they don't, they don't, when, when, they're, when a fire or a hurricane is bearing down, you don't have time to pack. You don't have time to like, well, I need that flash drive with my family pictures you know you just need to get out so i had fun building this go bag with with my kids it was like a a little scavenger hunt have you um before we move on have you practiced scenario like that like let's say you and the kids wanted to go camping and you said all right we're going to pretend like we've got to go we're going to take our go bags and literally go camping for a day or so and you know have this like scenario this prep scenario haven't done that although um i will say for a, a cbs sunday morning story I took a survival class and I was thinking it would be, you know, nutcases with their ammo and their hoarding gasoline and all that stuff. And it really wasn't. It was like, like cool ways to turn your raincoat into a tent in a pinch, you know, how to, how to cook something out in the wild. If you're desperate, what, what can you eat 
where can you find clean water, stuff like that. And it was actually totally fun. In in the book, I'm actually recommending that you do that with your with your family. It's it's an it's an unforgettable, different kind of outing. Again, it leaves you feeling more accomplished and more confident. And it has nothing to do with, you know, the aliens are coming or the government's coming. It has nothing to do with that. It's just feeling like we've gotten so out of touch with how our ancestors used to be able to fend for themselves that it's kind of cool to know that you can still learn those skills. Yeah, it just sounds like practical stuff. It sounds kind of fun, depending on how hard it is. But yeah, yeah, like a mini survivor, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you feel after doing this latest book? Do you feel prepared for climate change or do you just feel informed about uh, things you can do? Like what, how has it changed your life and how you go about your daily life? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of these things I, uh, I did do myself. I did switch to an electric car. I did r- review my insurance, which like most people, this policy was bought years ago under a <laughs> different time of my life. And I found out that it was way out of date. There's, so there's a lot of things that, that, that I, a lot of steps I took myself. But the other thing that I learned is that the gloom and doom about climate change is a little bit outdated. There is so much going on. I feel like in the last two years, the world has totally changed. Like corporations, which are traditionally the biggest polluters, corporate for now, now for corporations, it's considered cool to be a good emissions citizen. I mean, they are advertising how they're reducing their emissions and not just the public, but their investors and also their employees care about that stuff. You know, two years ago, Amazon didn't even have a climate program and the the employees kind of rose up and demanded it. And now Amazon has this incredible, they're investing $10 billion in climate solutions. They're buying a hundred thousand electric delivery vans. It's amazing. And it came from within. So this is happening in governments and companies all over the world in, in ways that really matter. I just read today that Texas last year has the highest percentage of power generated from solar and wind of any of the 50 states. It's like 22% of their power, even though it's an oil and gas state. I know. Um, that's why we had these uh, these blackouts this year, which was terrible. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. They, they do it in the right way this time. We'll see. Yeah. So I do feel like I, I feel like the decarbonization is going to happen. Uh, it might take 80 years or 50 years, but I, I do believe it will happen. And this era of burning coal and oil for power is is going to be, you know, something our ancestors used to do. Well, what do you think will be the main uh, energy producing and dis- uh, distributing sources going forward? Which ones seem to have the most promise? Well, I think solar and wind are the obvious ones. They are now so cheap. I mean, re- ridiculously cheap. I mean, solar, solar in 2020 surpassed coal for the first time, sorry, renewables surpassed coal in production in this country for the first time in history. Like the, the graphs, the graph lines crossed because coal is on its way out. There are no new coal plants planned for the United States and solar and wind are on the rise because they're so cheap. Like solar power is what, seven cents a watt now and down from you know, $2 a a watt in the seventies. And we we weren't expecting to get to that level for another 50 years or, you know, 70 years. And it's just because the, the equipment got so cheap thanks to Chinese manufacturing. So solar and wind, but there are also some really cool experiments in safer nuclear plants. It turns out, I found out researching this book that the reason we use uranium in our nuclear plants, which is what makes them dangerous is that the government wanted to invest simultaneously in weaponry and power. So they wanted an element that could be dangerous. They wanted to be able to make nukes out of the same materials. But there are other elements that you can do nuclear power with that don't have the danger cell elements of, of uranium. People are working on that. Bill Gates is investing in, in a cool new technology. All of these things are meltdown proof and um, don't have the problem with you know, used materials and storing them and stuff like that. So if we can make those work, wow, we'll be in great shape. Do you think there could be a resurgence of nuclear, but a a new form of nuclear, like you said, that is meltdown proof and uh, run differently? Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can. Yeah, thorium. That's the one. Thorium, the, the earth has 500 times as much of this element as we have uranium. So it's way cheaper. 
the system is meltdown proof. You don't need cooling systems. You can build the plant anywhere. And the material, once you're done using it for power, is useless for weapons. And they made, they tried this 60 or 70 years ago, but the, the government abandoned it because it couldn't be weaponized. Well, now we don't care about that. So all over the world, there are experiments in India, China, Russia, France, and the U.S. trying to start a thorium plant going. So I think it's very possible. Very good. Um, any other innovations in um, solar or wind or geothermal or other types of all you know, energies are, that aren't well known? Yeah, people are uh, experimenting with with tidal energy, you know, the power of the waves. I think that's kind of a long shot. A lot of people are very excited about hydrogen as a fuel for planes and cars. Hydrogen engines put out nothing but water. There's no emissions at all. It's getting, it's slow getting started because you need, you need to create the hydrogen fuel, which is itself very energy intensive. I'm not sure that's going to catch on in a huge way. But there's also a lot of really exciting work done in carbo- carbon removal technologies. These are these big plants, and there's 17 of them up and running now, that suck carbon dioxide out of the air. And they either pump it into the ground or they turn it into fertilizer and cement and plastic and things like that. We would need a lot of those plants to, to make a difference in the world. But there are a lot of them running costs need to come down, but they are dropping. And uh, some major, major corporations are investing in these these plants. Interestingly, a lot of them are oil companies, Exxon and so on. And you can probably guess why. (laughs) They're like, oh, wait a minute. If we could suck the carbon dioxide back out of the air, then we don't need to decarbonize. People can keep buying coal and oil. Hey. (laughs) So I'm not sure that's... I mean, I guess another way to look at it is they've been involved in energy for so long. If they were actually invested in doing things the right way, they have a lot of the infrastructure, the delivery mechanisms and everything. So they may be ironically best positioned to help. That's true. That's true. They have, yeah, the advantages of scale and experience. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is it would be best if we stopped burning coal and oil. Um, that That is best. And if if the energy companies have their way, that decarbonization process would be slowing down. So that's not great. But uh, but yeah, if we can suck carbon dioxide back out of the air, why not? Yeah. So what's, um, what's your overall thought? Are we on the edge of huge problems? Or like, how is this going to play out over the next 50 years? What's your estimation? I, I think people need to recognize that a lot of damage has been done. We are not experiencing the weather we had in the 80s, and we're not going to in our lives or our kids' lives or our grandchildren's lives, those days are gone. So the extreme weather we're experiencing now and the the problems with agriculture and storms, droughts, floods, hurricanes, wildfires are going to keep getting worse until, I don't know, maybe 2050. I mean, the world world doesn't turn on a dime. If we stop burning stuff right now, 93% of the Earth's new heat is stored in the oceans which take decades to cool down. So I think it's important that we recognize that that the world has changed already. So the remaining question is, is it going to become this hellscape that we people try to panic us with? If we, if we make no changes, yeah, it will become a hellscape. And there are huge ripple effects like the displacement of millions of people. Those areas we talked about that are going to be underwater or un, unlivable. Those people have to go somewhere. And when masses of people move into new areas, that's conflict. That's wars. So that's that's kind of a terrifying side effect. But the point is, it's not going to be business as usual. We are making huge changes. We are going to rescue this situation from the hellscape of 2100, where Boston's underwater and New York's underwater completely. Miami, I do think, is going away, by the way. <laughs> I think Miami, it's a low-lying land, and you can't build seawalls because the ground itself is porous, so the water comes up from underneath. But anyway, so the answer is yes, a lot of damage has been done, but I do think the signs are good that we're going to decarbonize in the next few generations and save ourselves from the worst of it. Yeah, hopefully so. Well, very good. Uh, David, what's the best way for – I mean, you have so much – such a wealth of information. Um 
is it just get the new book that you've written or what's the best way to start engaging with you and your content? What's your recommendation? Yeah, well, I guess I recommend uh, the book, of course, How to Prepare for Climate Change and and also the the podcast, Unsung Science, which is available anywhere. I think it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's for non, non-scientists. It's it's the me you've just heard. And on Twitter, I'm just my last name, Pogue. P is in Peter, O-G-U-E. That's my Twitter handle. Okay. Well, very good. David, it's really cool to talk to somebody like you with all this experience. Uh, so thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, man. That was super fun. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.